Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled, A Pathway to Successful Exterior Deck Installations. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association, and I want to welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's sponsored uh, webinar by Noble Company. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you'll be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions, and we'll answer those questions at the end of this presentation. If the audio on your computer is poor, please call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone. All NTCA webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented. This gives you easy access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. All right, today I'm, I'm very excited. I get to introduce these two gentlemen and uh, these speakers and uh, who are really good friends of mine and uh, very great speakers and have a great program here. Our first of two speakers is Dean Moylanen and uh, he's a division nine waterproofing, crack isolation and permeation specialist who advises on some of the most demanding and prestigious projects in the United States. As a 35 year veteran of the tile industry, Dean's relationship with architects, builders, and owners allows him access to some of the most challenging and compelling design issues in the industry. Dean's extensive career on job sites gives him a real world perspective uh, as he has seen firsthand success and failures relating to uh, product selection, installation issues, and sequencing uh, challenges. Our second speaker today is James Medina. Is it Medina or Medina? I'm sorry. Medina. I'm from the West Medina. Coast, so it's, you're All Midwest. Right. It's, it's Medina. All right. I was right then. It was, it's Medina here, but it's Medina. Your name is James Correct. Medina. All right. <laughs> James Medina, and uh, his background is in construction, stems from 30 years of experience in the industry. He started out as a licensed contractor and worked with general contractors as a project coordinator and project manager. In 2004, while working with uh, wind design and realizing that flooring was his true passion, James earned his certification in flooring forensics. This gave him a different outlook on every project and approach to installation. This unique insight into why floors failed in residential, commercial, and hospitality helped James to analyze and solve some of the most perplexing failures. His mission is to educate design professionals on the current and future approaches to the challenges in the industry and to find out answers to why installations fail. All right, you guys, I'm really excited to see what you have today. And uh, I'm signing off for a while and I'm going to listen. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, All right. Jim. All right. Thank you, Jim. And of course, uh, we have done a lot of these over the years. Uh, we're always grateful to have the opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of change happening. In fact, we were talking about uh, before uh, the presentation started that just there's been a lot of emphasis and growth in exterior hardscapes, outdoor living. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, oh, by the way, this was a great looking crowd this morning. Oh, yeah. oh, man, you guys look fantastic. Yeah, and did you know we can see you? Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Okay. But all anyway, right. uh, hit the deck. Uh, it is a, uh, well, first of all, talk about, well, yeah, hey, can I, can I, hey guys, can I jump in real quick? I forgot yeah, sure. to mention something that I think is really important to our audience, ahead, but if ahead. you guys look, look at the, on the, uh, your control panel, you'll see handouts. There's uh, four or five handouts oh, on yes. there. Um, one of them is how you, how you record or, or ask for your, uh, CEU for AIA. This is an AIA, uh, presentation accredited. And there's some questions and things on there, some handouts, but please take a peek at that. And guys, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead. That's no, really, no, no, that was really important. Mm -hmm. and, I, and you know what? You asked us to remember to say that, and we forgot to do that. So okay. thank you, Jim, for catching that. It's all but good. Yeah, the, the, those handouts are really important because you're going to actually be able to see this entire presentation at your convenience if you want to look at those handouts. So it's really important to do yeah. that. But, but about, about, about our company. Go yeah, ahead. a little bit about Noble before we get started. Uh, Noble has been around for over 75 years. You can see. Right here, we're, uh, we're located in Michigan, <clears throat> and uh, we're held by a company called Federal Processing uh, that's located in Cleveland, Ohio, FPC. Uh, but we are 100% US-based company, very proud to, to uh, manufacture our uh, sheet membranes, or drains, or niches, or benches, all the parts and pieces that we have 
here in the U.S. Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. Spring and Lake, Michigan. Spring Lake, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Shall we start? Let's roll. Let's roll. So this is an approved AI, you know, learning opportunity, yeah. and we follow all the rules and guidelines. So uh, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And so if you are uh, needing your credit, uh, if you need these credits, you make sure that you uh, communicate that properly with Jim Olson as well as uh, us on online, and we'll make sure that that comes to you. It's also IDCEC. I know we're seeing more and more uh, designers mm -hmm. and people uh, affiliated with these organizations who want these credits. And so, and we hope that there's some out there today because we're there, gonna, are, there are, we're going to be talking about uh, some of these design elements as they go out into the exterior. Deck. Aesthetically pleasing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, we were talking earlier, hardscapes, uh, that's one description of it, outdoor living, ceramic tile, natural mm -hmm. stone. Of course, there's been a lot of that bit that's been installed over the generations in exterior environments, but it seems as of late, there's been some uh, an increased emphasis commercially, residentially. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, it has added to the value of much of these construction projects, whether it's hospitality or uh, commercial or residential, it adds to the value of that space, like a square footage that you essentially are going to go live out on. But there are some, you know, there are some caveats some some things to be aware of and uh, some pitfalls, you know, that over the years has been a pattern of both success and failure. And we're going to take a look at some of the most common, common areas of concern and yeah. uh, hopefully provide some some insight remediation yeah yeah some okay. pathways to success we're also going to talk a little bit about how we we've seen some misinformation out there like uh let's say i sell a waterproofing product and they say well this is good for everything no not necessarily they're all not all made yeah. equal we talk about details we're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, common problems but we're also more importantly going to address some of the issues that could cause an issue and we're going to have yeah. solutions and that's that's really going to be the fun part. And, and, and most times, it's it's never when there is a problem or a failure. It's hardly ever just one thing. It's it, usually a combination. So let's is, and and we'll, we'll we'll get to those things. Yeah. But I want you to look at my new condo that yeah, I bought in Miami. Yeah. James is uh, doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, comes go. They pay that guy. Let's talk much. to my boss. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you look at this uh, beautiful exterior deck. It's overlooking the ocean. You can see everything out there. And it is so attractive, you know, and maybe this is at a hospitality project, whatever the case may be, but it adds to the value of that project. Now we but, go into the residential. And, you know, and, and, and the line gets more and more blurred because uh, as you go to some of these destination resort, all inclusive, you know, their, their whole, their whole goal is they want you to stay at that inside that resort. They want you to feel like the room you're in is more than just a hotel room. It's an outdoor living space. There's a balcony. There's, uh, so whether it's residential or commercial, the themes of success and failure are very, uh, they parallel each other. Right. And so we're going to take a look at just some of the things that can trip you up oh, on your exterior. Desk. Absolutely. And and I'm, so, I'm sure everybody knows that there's a growing trend of exterior kitchens that are being done because people want to be outside. Yep. Uh, and, and so you can see how this is done. done. We, we, Dean and I live in Las Vegas. We uh, sorry for us, you know, we have 360 days of sunshine. Yeah, but the only thing cooking right now on exterior decks is, is us. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, hot. it's, it's really hot outside. Hot to cook. <laughs> but so yeah. let's look at nine points, nine points that we really have to consider whenever we're doing the design process. But let's consider these nine points. The first one that is really critical that you have to think about is improper substrate. Mm. It sounds simple, like, you know, well, you have to look at the manufacturer's information to see if that substrate is acceptable. What 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 is encapsulated in an improper substrate? And let's face it, when you put tile and stone outside and you're using and look, dry pack mortar is still a very popular means of achieving that goal outside. Nothing wrong with it. No, no, wrong. no, absolutely it's not. It's worked for years. Uh, yeah. But there's a lot of weight, a lot of mass, and you know, especially residentially, but sometimes commercially. When you add all that weight and mass to your exterior deck, was it even designed to withstand that kind of additional load? But even on the other side of that, if it was designed, you have to think about the installer that has to bring all that product up to that area mm -hmm. to do logistics. Yeah, oh, yeah. the logistics is crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, movement joints, uh, whether you're inside or outside, all is a concern. But when you go outside, the, the thermal cycling, just the, the, the extreme variances between a really hot, 
sunny afternoon and then a, you know a thunderstorm rolls in and you know you've got hail and the the temperature drops 20 25 degrees i was in chicago last week and chicago. i think it, it, chicago in, in the morning it was 44 degrees mm. and, and toward the late afternoon it was 89 so you look at the, that span in temperature that day and what happens to the exterior uh, products, it's got to be crazy. And in here in Vegas as well, we get 30 to 40 spans uh, swing in temperature easily in a day. I, a lot of the, you know, you know, I've been with Noble, or Noble for 24 years, yeah. but uh, outside of the company, uh, just in the exterior application part of the industry, things like lack of movement joints are historically an issue oh, and they're even more absolutely. so outside now uh, another point that we're going to cover is is deck to door details now it sounds a pretty pretty simple idea you know i got to connect my waterproofing to the the structure but this detail is often ignored and so we want to make sure that we do not ignore that well wind driven rain people even in las vegas somewhere or lake havasu you know two or three inches of rain a year when it comes, it comes all at once and often accompanied by 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds, mm -hmm. that rain's going sideways. And so a lot of people who are doing decks don't think of the area right past where the deck ends and the internal part of my house begins. So, or, or the waterproofing in their instance is a towel inside the door. <laughs> they yeah. make sure that they keep it dry. You want to cover that next detail? Well, I, again, you know, when you get on an exterior environment uh, and you put a hard surface down, uh, you know, were there ever drains there to begin with? Yeah. And uh, what, what's, you know, how's it connecting to that drain? How am I getting water off the deck? Yep. Yeah, it, that's, it, that's it really... comes down to something that simple. How is the water getting off the deck? And some people go, oh, well, just let it roll down the edge. Well, what's below, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or how long does it take the, to the get there? The entrance to your home is below the deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so then they have also uh, the, the, the termination at the end of a deck your edge detail that exposed edge how is that being treated that's a question that comes up a lot and uh sometimes often ignored and causes uh some huge issues well the capillary action i mean anytime that a part of your detail could be exposed to moisture over time that moisture will wick and move and and, and it's just, it's astonishing i've seen uh decks with exposed front edges that had water migrating two and three feet uh into the deck so it's it's so it's on, on that topic on that, that where that terminates at, at the wall edge is that lack of flashing up that wall where your building structure is where that deck is meeting that building you want to make sure that you address that flashing detail properly and it's i'll tell you it, it really is it's almost stunning over the years i've seen a lot of, of deck installations going down and some failures and a real commonality is something as simple as they didn't flash up to the main dwelling right and you hear a lot of excuses why but uh yeah, it has to have. We'll go into more detail as we yeah. go along here. Uh, penetrations on waterproofing. That could be an issue where you have post penetrations, rail penetrations on a deck. How is that detailed? How are you addressing those penetrations on that deck? Um, you want to make sure that we have that detail properly. And last but not least, which is, of course, a, a huge passion for us. Yes. Did you waterproof it correctly? Did you use it, uh, the correct type of waterproofing for that application? uh whether it's a liquid a sheet membrane whatever the case there are certain factors that you have to think about when you're waterproofing any deck <clears throat> some of these points we're gonna you know we're gonna repeat uh a couple times because not the rep nausea. Re repetition be uh breeds familiarity correct hopefully not contempt but familiarity but improper substrates uh you know here's a, of course a forensic shot of a deck that went wrong and you know, from looking at this photo, you can only speculate, uh, you know, it looks like, gosh, they use the correct substrate. There's multiple things happening. Yeah. Okay. It's multiple a, things here. You see it's a raised deck. Uh, but when you when you come to something like this, you can see that they did a, a brick set, which we have been beating our heads for multiple years of why you do not do a 50-50 split on, on, on ceramic tile. But it's it's a detail that they, they, they recommend that you don't do that. But more importantly, if you were an installer and you're coming up to this substrate and you're like, they get, hey, we want more tile on this. Is this considered uh, acceptable? Well, I mean, what we see oftentimes is people, it's hard to believe, will install ceramic tile or natural stone 
on top of wood. Oh. Or uh, they'll say, oh, hey, they'll use a cement backer board, but here's an area of granularity you want to be aware of. Was that cement backer board, is that cement backer board approved for exterior applications? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name names, but there are several cement backer boards or uh, considered cementitious substrate backer boards. And they will tell you we can be used outdoors, but try to get that in writing. So make sure <laughs> if you're, you know, there's a variety of things you don't want to use, of course, yeah. plain old wood or backer board that is not acceptable in exterior applications. Those are just two of the more common ones. Especially on a raised application like this, you want to make sure that beyond the acceptable substrate, you want to make sure its structural stability is there as well. So just be aware, very aware of that. And here's an example, like, you know, okay, we see a cement backer board being put down. First question you want to ask is, is it suitable for exterior environments? Mm -hmm. I know oftentimes I hear this, uh, I just got back from Hawaii where I was working, by the way. Uh, but you know, uh, over there, especially, well, it's a covered lanai, it's a covered deck. Well, that's great, but rain's going to, rain can blow, blow sideways. Uh, yeah, the elements, in Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to use cement backer board, you have to follow all the recommendations of screwing it down mm -hmm. and bonding it down and taping it. And uh, uh, all these boards actually have dots on them where you can put your screw. And, and it's they're trying these these manufacturers are really trying to help individuals when they're doing these installations. And they, and they put it on there to tell you how many screws should be there, how the spacing is. So after you've inspected your substrate and inspecting it means have a level. I don't see a level by him, but. You want to make sure it's pitched out so the water is this sloped out on the slope. Yeah, it yeah. looks very flat. Um, then you look at, you know, is the board approved uh, that he's going to be installing the cementitious board on top of? So there's a lot of factors here that he has to think about as he's doing this. And when system. failures happen, like for example, you think someone's being nitpicky, but is the actual thin set rated for exterior use? Mm. Now, everyone goes, oh, come on. But when things go wrong, Questions like that get asked by forensic that, inspectors that and bag manufacturers. Will be, yeah. That bag will be red, and it, we will find out if it meets those. R E A D red, right? Yeah. Then that R E D red. Yeah. Correct. Right. All right. So, uh, load, weight, um, just sheer mass. Uh, you know, again, dry pack mortar, time honored method of creating a substrate. Absolutely nothing wrong with that type of method. But so, since this is a granular conversation, yes. You know, we look at at the weight. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that it's a time-honored tradition that we do. I grew up doing mud. I understand mud. I, I love mud. I, it's a very zen thing to, for me. Okay. But I've never really thought about how much it weighed. Really never gave it much thought. And uh, our TCNA manual, if you have one available to you, next to you, or you are taking notes, if you look on page, uh, the, the forward portion of, of the detail sections on page 60, uh, I think it's in the 60s. 66. Yeah, page 66. But you have exterior uh, roof and deck floors on page mm -hmm. 66 and uh, another detail on page 70. Um, you can see uh, these details and they have a number on them. So this one is F103B. Now, if you look at this application and you're trying to see how it's going to work for your project, you can flip to the back of the book on page 451 mm -hmm. and it will actually give you estimated weights for that application. There's a lot of information. I know, yeah. but, it, no, no, but there's, it's a good thing. This, this yeah. is very important, yeah. Because especially for a structural engineer to say, well, how much is this this or a concerned weight? homeowner? Just yeah. How much weight am I adding to my deck? Right here in the detail, I'm going to share it with you, Dean. Okay. Thank how you. How much is one square foot of that detail F104, 103B? I need weight. a new prescription, I think. Can you uh, see? Ceramic tile, 21 pounds. 21 pounds per square foot. Per square foot. C ceramic, I mean natural stone, 23. 23. Well, those are averages, but that's a lot of weight. Yeah, per square foot. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the weight factor of how that affects the deck, but how much weight you're talking about on an average deck. But you can see how thick this more this this uh, dry pack insulation is going, how thick it is. You can just imagine how heavy that's going to be. And now mm -hmm. this isn't a raised application, but if it was, you can really have to. But also, too, too part of it is with dry pack mortar. By the time you put enough dry pack mortar down, it may not jibe with your the details of your doors. So there's a, but there are some things that are happening in the industry to help address that. We'll get to that right on the road a little bit. Yeah. So we're going to beat on movement. We always talk about movement. EJ171, very, very critical thing that you have to consider on an exterior application.
this is an example of uh, an installation as we see if you've gone through any walking uh, in, in some commercial applications uh, and you see a crack something like this there's almost a guarantee that there's a saw cut joint below that was not addressed with an any fracture membrane on top of it or an, if it wasn't any fracture membrane it wasn't rated for high performance because that's where the dynamic movement's going to happen could possibly be deflection too if it, if if those if those beams and joists and that substructure mm -hmm can't accept the additional weight and you start getting some deflection. Yep, then what usually happens with that is if you look at that dry pack deck on that little detail that we have on the bottom here, a crack comes through. Yeah. And if that is inadequate that, that you have on top the, the uh, for making, for uh, addressing the movement, what happens? Well, it's gonna be a direct transfer of that movement right to your finished finish good. And one thing I think it's, it's uh, I wanna note is that there are, when we talk about movement protection, movement joints, and of course there are crack isolation membranes. Correct. There are, are uncoupling systems. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note, those are two different approaches. Oh, there's, there's some confusion sometimes. Yeah. They're not interchangeable. No. Uh, they, uh, there are, there are, there's test method, methodology and anti-standards. Right, so you, you, you peeled off that bandaid. Yeah. So now you have, no, 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 <laughs> now, 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 Jim's probably laughing at this no, point, no, no. but you know, I've heard it in the past. They say, oh, well, you know, and we're uh, not saying one's better than no, the other. No, no, no. They're they just, just they're they different. Have, they're different. They are different and they react differently mm -hmm. in, a, in a way. And if you have a TCNA book and you go to page 22, it's called the membrane section. And in that section, you've got cleavage membranes, vapor retarders, waterproofing membranes, low perm waterproofing membranes, crack isolation membranes, uncoupling membranes, and bonded sound reduction membranes. As you go through each one of these different products or, or uh, uh, membranes, they are related to an ANSI test, which goes to it. Waterproofing is ANSI 118.10, crack isolation is ANSI 118.12. The only one, and, and uh, ANSI 118.13 is for sound, bonded sound reduction membranes. But the uncoupling membrane, though they're working on this, uh, and I hope they, they complete it, but the second sentence right there says they're not characterized by ANSI or ISO because they don't have a test for that. I do it's, believe, it's designed in all fairness, I think they are working at yeah, they are, having they are a, working for an it. ISO or some kind of standard fairly soon. But I just, the point is, they're not the same. No, they but they they are two the, different ways of approaching. If you're concerned about movement, yes. Besides movement joints, you might put down a crack isolation membrane, but they do exactly what they're supposed to do. They keep yeah, that yeah, that installation yeah. intact, right, while it breaks free from the substrate. That's what you have to understand what an uncoupling membrane does. Yeah. So just just having that knowledge and understanding of it is very critical and very important when you're when you're uh, going to specify or use any right. product on that substrate. Yeah. And here's a look when you don't put down movement joints, uh, the thermal cycling, the changes, the movement, the tile or stone will find a way to find relief and tenting, doming, crack tile, it's crack gonna, route It's going to fail at the weakest point. All, all of the above, yeah. Yeah, and, if, and the weakest point may be where it wasn't bonded with adequate uh, an adequate amount. So whenever you look at soft joints, it allows that movement. You're making little mini movement islands, if you will, on that substrate so that it can take that movement. It's critical, it's important. And uh, the good news is with some of the high performance crack isolate membranes out there, you can actually move your, put your movement joints within the grout joint. Mm -hmm. So you're not ripping across, back in the good old days, sometimes you had to rip right through yes. the tile or stone to follow a saw cut joint or a cold right. joint. The good news is with some of these high performance crack isolate membranes, you can relocate those movement joints to a grout joint. Yeah, and, and actually that was one of the changes in the TCNA manual. They actually have a new detail that is that is uh, that addresses that exactly, and it's uh, EJ171M. EJ171M shows that staggered joint. Very good. Next topic. Uh, ranches down at the commercial project in uh, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got this great waterproofing system on your exterior deck. You're going to hit uh, whether it's sliding doors or French doors, whatever entrance exit path you design from your interior living space to your deck. You have to think of where am I going to terminate that membrane? And uh, we've seen that if you can move it before all the tracking gets put in, before Correct. all the attachments, the fixtures for the door gets put in, put that membrane system a couple, two, three feet inside the building because you're going to have wind driven rain. The, the thing is, that you, you would never stop shy of the finish line if you're in a race. 
and, and that's essentially what you would do if you stopped your membrane or waterproofing product before you go get to that doorway. You don't want to terminate it right at that doorway. You want to make sure that it goes in uh, and detailed properly. Here's cool. no, oh, go. no, no, you got no. Well, you know, just one of these things that maybe uh, when you wanted tiles shown on your exterior deck, a couple things going on here. You got to wonder if there's adequate, you know, two percent quarter inch per foot slope. Um, I'm not wondering it. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be kind here. Yeah, and, I know uh, you are. You know, uh, it, you know, where the this whole edge detail, this balcony detail, balustrades, railings, whatever you want to call it, uh, looks like there's no way. For, is there? Are there scuppers beneath you can there? You literally see the standing water. Yeah. At the bottom left hand side of this this picture, you can actually see where there's a drain. Oh yeah, you're, yeah you can. Yeah, you yeah. can see. Yeah, you can. But unfortunately, this picture. <laughs> And this next one, yeah. though this has a complete opening for the water to get off, yeah. not proper pitch, not you know adequate pitch for, for the water to get off or even get to a drain, mind you. And obviously this is a, an issue that is occurring all the time. This is a place that has a lot of water. How do we know? Look at the staining on the stone on the surface. Obviously it, it is, it, the issue of standing water is a, a major issue here. And there's a slip fall liability of both, you know, oh, yeah. you, you don't Maybe, want your, yeah. your mom or your dad or your guests slipping and falling uh, on your exterior deck. And most certainly if you're, uh, you know, a lot of hotels, hospitality here in Las Vegas are, these exterior decks are now becoming revenue sets yes. for them. They're, 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 they're uh, dance clubs. They're mm -hmm. another way to create uh, re revenue. But uh, take a look at this. Do uh, you see the bowing, uh, uh, the, 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 the deflection happening yeah. on the side of that deck now? One might speculate is that do you have another we said it's hardly ever just one thing we have a failure yeah do we have some deflection going on is that one thing leads to the other yeah yeah you know it, it may have gone in and they might have had proper pitch but after uh the building is settled the insulation settles the rain comes and uh, the added weight of people on there may have compromised the structure enough where it gets uh that that bowing and that dipping within that uh, that installation so you know these are things you have to think I'm about as you go it. through we're just checking our time here, folks. Yep. Um, all right, so you know, wrap the edges. We talked about that earlier. Uh, here's some examples of, you have to wrap the edge. Yeah, okay? this this is a sticking point for you. It's an, well, it's an aesthetic, it's an aesthetic, jarring aesthetic uh, vi uh, vision to confront, but it's also a way for water to get into your system. Yep. Uh, either on, we're, uh, there's some projects uh, and down happening down in Lake Havasu where uh, they're taking great care these are really large decks, but they're taking very great care to make sure the size of these decks have uh, a means of being covered and waterproofed and aesthetically pleasing. Yes, uh, and, and it's a simple thing. You never want to leave something raw, open, and exposed to the elements. That's uh, that, that. This is the results of what would happen. Framing damage, uh, the structural damage that happens on a home. You you may have saved a penny at the very beginning or time, you know, per square foot, and not using a certain product, but what are you ultimately spending in the end? And look at these slides, you know, this up slide in the upper left hand side. Obviously, you know, I'm hard to believe, but I've seen decks pitched back towards the house. Mm -hmm. Looks like that's happening here. And then, of course, the deck just gave away. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, uh, the weight of what was, you know, the combined, uh, the weakening of the structure by intrusion of water, mm -hmm. the additional weight uh, of whatever's on top of this. You uh, can framing. see on the on the upper picture on the left hand side how that's bowing down and they had to put a board up there to hold it in place. I mean, it is it is horrible, uh, but this happens more often than we'd like to admit, and we've seen it out in the industry. Another sticking point that we have is where you are flashing as you meet the the structure itself. So if you have a structure and you have to have that waterproofing flash up, there are uh, products out there in the industry. Uh, an example here below is a foam or, or honeycomb product that they use as a base. It's got ethos on it. Basically, you it it's allows you to think about cutting up the six the desired six or eight inches on that structure and putting your waterproofing in place and then having something to put over the top of it to make it look good. And and then we again we can only share what we've encountered. And on more than a few decks, you know, these are really expensive projects. And oftentimes these decks are almost after the fact or additional, okay, we're good. We decided we're putting tile stone in this deck area. And the the stucco's in place, the ephus mm -hmm. is in place, the siding's in place, 
uh, the brick, whatever finish details on that wall is in place. But and then have go, to, oh, I don't want to take that off. Can I just put the waterproofing right up to it? Please? You're going to have a failure. Yeah, you're going to have a, and we've seen failures for that reason. So uh, be very mindful of yeah, that. Yeah. Pipe penetration, uh, pipe penetration. I keep on saying pipe penetration, but there are some, it's, there's just some, well, pipe it's, it's, you know, there are sometimes pipe penetrations on decks. Yeah. And then you also have post penetration. So if the deck has a post and it goes through your waterproofing, look at the manufacturer's details that they may have, how to address it. So here we have an example of a liquid waterproofing being applied. They want to make sure that there's reinforcement fabric around it. They want to make sure it's lapped up, the, uh, the uh, uh, adequate amount. Uh, they want to put it over their seams. So you can see the great detail on following these manufacturer's recommendations on applying a waterproofing membrane. But we're going to emphasize a lot about how the living space within goes outside. And this is a good example of that. You know, and you've got this beautiful, you know, very unique, almost one of a kind entry exit onto the exterior deck. Uh, and I just, again, speaking from experience, more times than not, membrane, the water being terminates at that door. Yep. And time and time again, you've always used that term, devil in the details. Yes. You've always said that to me. And yep. again, wind driven, you're going to have uh, wind driven uh, rain. And if, if you're in a, a climate that uh, you get some snow, you may have snow pile up. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, Northern so, California is now the, the 10 feet of snow that's on the top of their roof. Is now melting on i know that we're on their decks is now melting yeah they they're well aware of that so you know who, whoever system you use bring that membrane two or three feet into the interior yeah. to protect that area at some point you can't keep going forever but at least addresses the moisture that's going to be driven in by na mother nature correct now this is just an example of uh, a liquid proof <laughs> don't laugh you're not supposed to laugh yeah. Composure. So um, when you look at this particular installation, it's a liquid waterproofing membrane that's being used on, on we hope, an exterior rated plywood uh, deck. Um, uh, but there's multiple things you have to think about or consider when well, For you're, example, is do you even want to bond to wood on an exterior deck? I don't think you really want to, not, you don't want to do that. Concept. When you look at things and we hear about industry standards, Currently, the industry standard is that you should use a cementitious product on, over the top of wood. Now, it, it there are some products out there that will bond directly to wood. We're not saying, oh, no, you can't do that. But when we look at um, historically how it works, uh, we see the best results where a cementitious board is being used on top of that wood. So this is just an example of showing like uh, someone using a liquid. Now, there's nothing wrong with the liquid. I want everybody to understand there's nothing wrong with the liquid. If it's rated for exterior use. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. number two, when you're applying that liquid, what do you have to read and understand? Well, the manufacturer's instructions will supersede any kind of, people don't realize the TCNA recommendations are recommendations. Yes. So uh, if, if, if you're gonna use anyone's waterproof membrane, A, make sure it's rated for exterior usage, and then You've got to follow the instructions. I mean, instructions. it's as simple as following the instructions. How thick are you putting it in? You have to be able to measure it. You have to know how thick it is. Um, it's very critical that you follow these this information because you're gonna if it fails, you're gonna be asked if you installed it per the manufacturer's recommendations. And I would say over the years, a lot a lot of membranes that work fine on interiors mm -hmm. get dragged outside because the, the installer's familiar with it, yeah. or maybe uh, or maybe they're just not aware that, no, you just can't take your favorite system and assume it works okay outside. Yeah. And so so this is kind of a, a quick overview recap. of what we just recap. Yeah, what, so recap far, yeah. what we did so far. One, you know, you wanna make sure you follow these industry standards, consult with ANSI standards, TCNA, NTCA. It's really important that you do this because you wanna have a baseline. You wanna know exactly where you're gonna be. Uh, whenever you're looking at your substrate, make sure that there's no deflection or some issues with that deck because uh, if it's not structurally sound, don't start because now you don't have an acceptable substrate. Uh, whenever you're looking at how much movement that could be, do a quick a quick assessment of the area. What's the sun study in the area? Where is it, is it the deck going to be in the sun all day? Does it only get it toward the evening or the uh, afternoon? So you look at that all these different factors when it comes to 
uh, movement joints and soft joints. Don't ignore them. Perimeter joints and within the, the, the uh, actual installation, make sure you have those movement joints. Not to mention, I mean, look, most people are not structural engineers. No. And so if you have a, a legitimate question, uh, can my deck handle this increased weight? Uh, consult a professional. Yes. Always I mean, consult someone a who really can tell you uh, an exact answer based on their education. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't want to speculate on that kind of uh, that concern. Yeah. And when you're consulting a professional, whether it's a contractor, tile contractor, general contractor, look at the waterproofing that they're they're looking at using. Um, and when you look at that, also examine the details that are presented to you. Uh, you want to make sure that it does go beyond. It doesn't terminate right at the at the uh, flashing uh, where it should be flashed up the wall. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, there's some drainage. If there's a, a, a drain on that application, make sure uh, it's uh, the, the membrane actually can meet it properly. I think it's very safe to say any deck you want to convert to an area that's got ceramic tile and natural stone uh, and, and, and or you want waterproofed, as it exists, is probably not in a state ready to just, you're going to be doing something to yeah. make it acceptable for exterior applications. Absolutely. And so, you know, again, beyond and, the flashing, what else should they consider? Um, again, uh, I just figure out some way to wrap those edges. Yes. I make sure they're aesthetically uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, uh, no matter what the justification is, there is really, I'd say you're better off not trying to waterproof or change the living environment of your exterior deck to tile and stone with a waterproofing component. If you can't flash up to the main dwelling, yeah. You're gonna have a very expensive failure. You taking um, the responsibility on yourself if yeah. you do something like that. It's very yeah. foolish. You know, you, you shouldn't do that. Uh, you want to also look at those uh, post penetrations and railing because all all decks have it. You got to be safe. Um, how is how is that waterproofing gonna be flashing up to it? And you know, you know, I want to look at. There are several more than a few systems where you can actually install railing systems that are on the face yes. of the deck, so you yeah. don't have to worry about penetrations whatsoever. Yeah. But of course, that plays into your what your aesthetic requirements are and your budget, so to mm -hmm. speak. So, and of course, again, we're kind of beating these things uh, ad nauseum sometimes, but it's because you've seen these same failures for the same reasons. Make sure you have an exterior rated waterproofing system. Uh, but uh, there are some, here's the good news. There are some systems out there and some manufacturers that are trying to address some of the concerns like weight. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's look yeah, at yeah. let's look at a few of those details coming up. Yeah. So we talked about these details that are found on page 60 and page uh, 66 and 70 uh, on your, in your TCNA manual. These are your your minimums, right? These are the the uh, minimum standards that we have within our industry. Uh, so please, when you have the time, look at these details. It's very important to see if you're actually building within that. You're not going to go wrong if you follow if you follow these recommendations at a, at a minimum, you know, your chances are if you install it correctly, you're going to have a successful installation because yeah. uh, these these details have stood the test of time. Tried and true. Yeah. So can I talk about weight again? Go ahead. I want to talk a little bit about weight because we discussed. We got to hurry though because. I, I, we got okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> so when we look We're at long winded. Yeah. When we look at the weight of a structure, uh, we had mentioned before what that weight was. If you guys remember. Uh, Dean said with tile it was 21 pounds, with uh, stone it was 23, 23. pounds. Mm -hmm. So I did a little math. Dun, 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 dun. So if you have like a regular deck, it's like 20 by 40, that's 800 square feet. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so 800 square feet at 23 pounds per square foot, that's 18,400 pounds Ooh. on a deck. Wow, that's a lot of weight. That's, that's, lot that, of weight. that's not live load either. No, and that's the, yeah, that's before you have a party on that deck because yeah. you're so happy that you got it all done and it looks beautiful. And then you put a bunch of people on there. Party on your patio. Freeze. Oh yeah. And guess what happens? You, hopefully it holds the weight of, of that live load. Now, in the industry, we've seen a lot of companies that said, hey, they see an issue with it. They've seen deck failures. They've seen problems like that. And what they've done is developed a hybrid type of panel system mm -hmm. that you can put on it. Now, there's a lot of features and benefits to this that you look at uh, where, uh, Dean, you want to hold it up? I'll hold this one. I'll hold the picker and you hold the thing and we'll and so they basically imagine these are four foot by four foot panels mm -hmm. and they're going on a deck and if you can see in the image how it pitches down i'm going to back up a little bit but you can see how it pitches down come on right, Vanna, there we go. Vanna White here. Yeah, look. 
So you see how it, it pitches down and, uh, and pre-pitched uh, down to the edge of the deck. But that honeycomb well, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a proprietary blend of copolymers oh, yes. that are unique to that manufacturer's uh, manufacturing process. Yes. But the end result is a high strength honeycomb matrix, PSI of 235. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the lightweight. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there are several different systems like this out there. We're yes. showing you just one as a typical example. You have the lightweight foam, but the concerns about compression and point loading are resolved because you the honeycomb have. matrix uh, is PSI is 235. Yeah, so you, it gives the freedom for that designer and the architect to put a smaller format tile on it, or if, if they want to. Um, but there's there's a lot of freedom that is is given with that that. Um, I'm that grabbing PSI. stuff here, James. I'm grabbing stuff. So these pieces, these parts and pieces, can be pre waterproofed. And this is an example of a a uh, exter typical exterior water grade grade waterproofing membrane. Yeah. Uh, you read about it. What would make this different than a, a regular waterproofing membrane? Well, I mean, look, there are PVC sheet membranes, there are PE mm -hmm. sheet membranes, there are CPE, chlorinated polyethylene membranes, mm -hmm. okay? And they all have their good, better, best. Uh, uh, CPE probably has the highest performance uh, characteristics due to its uh, nature, its manufacturing process. Uh, and again, you've got a product that meets as anti-standard for, for crack isolation, right. high performance meets high performance. Um, Permeation is not a, a, as big a concern on exterior decks, but still, it's a low per membrane. Oh, yeah. And uh, again, when you go but to- What else is added to an exterior rated membrane? Uh, UV inhibitors, yeah. antioxidants. Right. Uh, and by the way, any membrane you put outside, liquid sheet uh, is not gonna be a wearing surface and you don't wanna expose it to UV. UV is a great enemy of uh, waterproof membrane systems outside yeah so we just want to make sure you address that yeah. properly when you're installing here's an example of a cut through on a, on a deck uh you would look at a typical deck uh system like this where you have a quarter inch cementitious board applied to the surface exterior rated exterior correct. rated and then there's a, a an adhesive uh, that is provided by the manufacturer to apply this uh pre-pitched board to it that goes on top and then the waterproofing membrane is then applied to that also with an exterior rated adhesive. Now, you notice that in this installation, there is no thin set being applied uh, with a cementitious product. They, it can break free, right? With an exterior rated adhesive, it has more movement and it stays very tacky. Well, tacky. If, 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 if it's a wet set adhesive, the very nature of the adhesive is going to allow, allow for some elongation. Now, again, if you use a exterior rated thin set, yeah. I, you know, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be okay, but Again, you have to make sure you go to that level of, of detail. Yeah, and, 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 and you will, you'll have a huge success. Now, again, do we leave room for movement? Have to, I just, it's, I mean, again, we've heard this, we've heard people say, uh, I don't want a movement joint to mar the aesthetic beauty of my large format, whatever, porcelain, glazed tile, or whatever they're using, but you have to, and the good news is, again, you, you, can, you can locate these, soft joints within a grout joint, but you have to make sure, especially exterior, Yes. Uh, to follow the details. Yeah, follow the details. And if you look at this detail that's here on EJ171K, um, this detail is very important for mo multiple reasons. And whenever you're doing something like this, make sure you add that back rod. You see that little hourglass flexible sealant that's showing there? Understand what that flexible sealant is. Can it be used on an exterior? Two and three, make sure you install it per the manufacturer's recommendations. That hourglass uh, detail that you see right there, it, it allows that that uh, sealant to expand and contract properly. That's the reason why it looks like that. So, by the way, don't use uh, when it says flexible sealant. Don't go down to Home Depot and Lowe's buy that 99 cents a tube. Yeah, uh, something you'd use on your on your shower for maintenance mm -hmm. or touch up. Make sure it's an exterior rated sealant design yes. for that application yeah and i've also seen some failures where there was a compatibility issue where somebody used a sealant uh and it, it reacted to uh some of these membranes that are on the market actually broke it down so we have to be very very uh aware of what is happening out within the industry now the next slide we're talking about is this uh taking that waterproofing that's on the outside into that doorway area this is an example of a doorway sliding door detail that uh, as you see in red, the red line shown there, 
is where that waterproofing membrane goes and extends inside that dwelling. Yeah, yeah and of course, you wish the drawing would show it, but um, actually far, extending yeah. a couple feet, uh, a, a couple of feet, I think, is is more than enough because again, you there's going to be wind-driven moisture that gets through those whatever your door assembly is. Yeah, it's very it's very critical. Now, another topic besides waterproofing is how does that waterproofing connect into a drain? That's really that's really critical. Uh, I have an example here, and it's in the picture right there. But this is a, an example of one drain that's being used on um, uh, on the uh, on the deck. If you're using a point drain, but what's unique about this drain is you don't see that there's a huge clamping ring here. Some drains have those massive clamping rings, but what happens is that it, that the, that size of uh, Clamping room will have these little weep holes. Now, what's interesting about this one, you don't see any weep holes on it, right? But what's more interesting is if you look in the inside of that drain, let me see if I could zoom in, you can see those channels. And in those channels that you see there, uh, those are weep channels. So it allows that installer uh, the ability to have a means of egress of that water on that deck to get off that deck and down the drain. And you may have, let's say, there, if you had some natural stone, that was, uh, you know, tying into that drain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't want water to pond at the base of that strainer. No. Okay. Uh, Halo it. So those channels allow for the water to migrate down into the into the into the uh, the, the, the drain assembly. Yeah. Uh, you can use clamping ring drains. There's nothing wrong. No, with nothing wrong with them. Conventional clamping ring drains, but just make sure that you and typically those are used with dry pack mortar systems. Yep. Uh, but make sure you keep the weep holes open. Yep. Oh, we're just giving you. These are. Uh, amount of water that's happening on that deck you would agree right and so let's say they don't go with a point drain and they go with a linear drain uh, there are different types of linear drains out there but one thing that's really critical when you're looking at any drains is a gallons per minute of water that goes GPM, through a drain. Yeah, the GPM. GPM. Uh, Dean has an example of one and they, they just basically attach the bond flange yeah. to it but you can look in the inside of the drain and and see how it's pre-pitched which increases so when you have your when you have your two percent flow to drain in the drain body, that means from raindrop one, it's flowing down towards the 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 the, the, the drain pipe. Okay, um, there are manufacturers of linear drains where they don't have a slope to drain. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they're inferior. No. Doesn't mean they're defective, but water has to build up more pressure mm -hmm. before it moves towards the drain. Yeah. Okay. So realize there are some manufacturers have a built-in slope to drain in their drain body. Mm -hmm. Some don't. Uh, some manufacturers have stainless steel. Uh, this is uh, some manufacturers have ABS or PVC. Correct. All right. Uh, so just it, be aware of the differences of all these different drains out within the industry and the yeah. performance standards of each one of those drains for so it can fit your job properly. So once again, here's a detail for wrapping the edges. Okay. Uh, and we're going to probably pick the pace up here a little bit yep. here, but uh, obviously we can't we, we can't. Oh, repeat this enough yeah. you really want to make sure you have those edges wrapped because it's a heartbreaking scenario to see a beautifully installed deck but because the side to the front of that deck didn't have um, a drip edge or counter flashing or sometimes you can, you can wrap the edge mm -hmm. and attach the membrane to the underside of the deck but make sure that those 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 exposed side elements are indeed covered and again we, we talk about all the devil and the details these are all little points to take away when you go through. Sometimes you use a riglet at the edge where that flashing comes up the wall. And here's an example of that styrofoam product that I talked about before, where they can use it, or you can use tile on that edge. It's a beautiful gray foam product too. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, help me. <laughs> so you can paint it whatever color you want, or you can just use tile uh, directly over the top of it. To, uh, but you do not want to ignore that flashing of the no. wall. I hear, hey, look, they didn't. They and sequencing wise, Correct. it's happening way before there's any kind of stucco or mm -hmm. side, whatever you're gonna put in front of this Tyvek, in front of this flashed up membrane. Yeah, that's great because it's flashing up. Yeah, for it. they follow the steps properly yeah. to make sure. Now the, the the detail above, you can see uh, the picture above. You can see how that flashing is brought behind that siding before the deck was put down, uh, and that's a detail that that is working. 
Uh, this one right here on the bottom, you can see how that flashing was not, it was ignored. It did not go <laughs> behind the waterproofing. He's smashing it out to see how that flashing on that little roofing section failed. Um, so never ignore that flashing up uh, that wall. Now you have multiple designs out there, beautiful designs in the industry. Look at this one up here with the beautiful railing and everything. Uh, if you are an architect or a designer, uh, make sure that you, whether it's in your specifications or you assign somebody in your office to have QAQC in the process to watch where that waterproofing is going. You don't want anybody to miss a step or not do the steps that you have to, had drawn, uh, such as the picture below where you have it flashing up a post or flashing up in, into on the, your uh, as existing structure or into a doorway, as you see here. Uh, you want to make sure that everything is followed. Once, well, yeah, once you look at this finished in installation, it's gorgeous. But unless you have someone watching the watchers, you yeah. know, QAQC, uh, we, you don't know did they did they flash up the side of the building? Did they extend the membrane uh, past uh, that that door that all that door tracking and the door assembly? Uh, Definitely, you don't there, want to find out later. Are there movement joints? Yeah. yeah. Now we talked about the handrails, you know, and the post penetrations. Now here's an option you can do where you actually have the post attached on the outside and it looks very nice. I'll show you an example of it right here where the posts are installed on the outside of that, that deck, but it still serves as a safety rail. Uh, and, it, and it looks aesthetically pleasing, if you will, if, you, if that's your- There's your different company. design elements yeah, out design there. design elements yeah. out there. Some use glass. But you're eliminating a major source. I mean, let's face it, it's a waterproof membrane. Uh, you, the less holes you poke in your waterproof membrane, the better off you are. So. <laughs> It sounds so simple, people. It sounds so simple, yeah. but uh, you'd be amazed yeah. at, at where that happens. So this is an example of a, uh, a spec that was written. Let me move this over so you can see, Dean. Uh, let me do oh, this. Yeah, we're okay, I think. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. You can talk about this slide. So you've got to use exterior. Again, we're going to say this for the third or fourth time. Exterior waterproofing must be used in outdoor environments, okay? And here you see... A specification that's written, mm -hmm. and uh, you know you have to identify: is is my membrane I'm using or, or specifying is it a secondary waterproofing system, or, or is, is it primary? primary? Yeah, because there are some products out there that are only really used for secondary waterproofing. Correct. Concerns. So you just have to be very aware of that. And we talked a little bit about the the differences in these different membranes of how how they're being used within our industry. We want to make sure that uh, they're used properly uh, make sure that if it's if it has to say for exterior use uh, you want to make sure you don't you don't shortcut uh, that application by putting more on okay so you, yeah. yeah using more uh, let's just yeah, yeah. say if you, oh, well, yeah, I'm just I'll gonna, just put four codes instead of two and exactly. now we're all good this no, should no, be good right no, no. no so look I think we'd all agree exterior decks are, are growing in popularity uh, again I just met with a big uh, company over Honolulu and they are nationwide and uh, their their whole premise for existence is outdoor hardscape mm -hmm. environments so uh, towards that end uh, the devil is in the details uh, exterior decks can be obviously installed correctly and waterproof correctly and and they can last for a long time but you know what we try to do was bring up the most obvious uh points of contention most Absolutely. obvious areas of failure by no means is this a complete uh you know comprehensive re a recap of every possible scenario but i think if you're aware of these issues before you, can, you start yeah project. you can at least have some sort of guidelines that you can go by and be comfortable with now one of the major guidelines that you want to look at is the labor that you're going to be using correct? it all flows it all flows from the labor yeah. because you can have the best specifications the best product the best intentions but uh you know you have to have qualified you should have qualified labor yeah so when you're writing when you're writing a specification make sure you put in there the qualified labor uh and, and in the tcna manual we also have uh, a section in there just that for qualified labor uh these contractors should be uh approved uh by these different uh, entities below training trade organizations trade, or, yeah. trade organizations below you can look at these websites to see who actually qualifies or has gone through the testing, which is very important. If you've ever gone to a coverings or surfaces show and you go there and you see these guys uh, doing the tile and stuff, they're not showing off. They're actually trying to pass a test yeah. to make them qualified installers. And I always say just 
you know, in our travels, uh, you know, I've been in the industry for almost like 35, 40 years yeah. now, and you've been in for a minute 30, or two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think overall the the, the skill set is improving. Yes. I think that the manufacturers technology is definitely improving. Yeah, yeah I think uh, manufacturers of ceramic tile, uh, setting products, alloy products, they're highly motivated to make sure that their products get put in correctly. Yeah. And I think uh, I, I know that on a, a nationwide uh, comprehensive level of, of education, things have gotten better. I think much seeing, better, much yeah. better through the years. Yeah. But you know, with all of that, please call them, call us. Yes. And and ask us. We we don't mind. Our information's in front of you. Also, uh, to reemphasize what Jim spoke about at the beginning on the side, the handouts in in that side column. Right. Uh, you can grab that information. Our our contact information there as well. How to get your credits? How to, how to get your credits? Yeah. So at this point. Dean and I would like to say thank you. Thank, thank you, you very for much. Your attention. Thank you for listening to us and and uh, having spending this part of your morning or afternoon with us as well. Um, now we'd like to entertain questions. Well, can we talk of Jim. Can we talk a, a, a few minutes about our products, or you want to wait? Oh, so why don't you go ahead and and talk about your uh, your products real quickly here? Okay, we'll make it very, very brief. Um, uh, we have just come out with a very lightweight, a prefabricated exterior deck system. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I'll grab a couple pieces. It's called Pro Deck. It's called Pro Deck. And essentially what we've done is taken this EPS foam, uh, the proprietary honeycomb matrix, and uh, the exterior rated primary waterproofing membrane. And we offer this in four by four modules. Uh, we can give it to you pre-waterproofed or not, mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you in the brief time that it's been out, uh, we're involved in some major products in Arizona, projects in Arizona, and doing some incredibly large decks, very elaborate. Uh, some of these are using 7, 10, 15 linear and drains. These are all pre-pitched, so the installer just goes in and says, okay, A goes here, yep. B goes here. And it's all pre-pitched and, and very well received. We actually give you a planogram. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a, a puzzle you put together, mm -hmm. but it's not just the weight, you know, saving th that much weight, but it's also the time element. I mean, to set this down yeah. as compared, and again, we're in no way saying anything Nothing negative about, about dry pack so. mortar. It's a, it's a great method. It lasts, it's very durable, but sometimes you don't have the time right. or the, the deck can't hold the weight. So it's called Pro Deck. Pro Deck. Check it out. Uh, yeah, go to our website. Give us a call. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's a perfect storm of opportunity because yeah. it's been out less than a month and we're getting tremendous response on it. So we're just going to talk. About, that's what we want you to think about as that's a segue. Take away. Yeah, some for today. Yeah. I'm glad you take your questions. Because there are any. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you two. I didn't know if you if I ever get through, but uh, good job. Fantastic. Hey, um. Hey, um so everybody, so everybody here, here. Real, quickly, real quickly, go to uh, uh, the handout the section, section on the, on the control, control panel, panel, and you and should be able to uh, click on click the on very first link, link, and it will give you all the information for you your AIA or IDCEC to EU. I uh, want to make sure you do that. So some of the things today, guys, I was listening to, and I really, I really enjoy this because I think this is important at every single one of our webinars and. That is that manufacturer's recommendations supersede any other method. Always, always look at the manufacturer's recommendations. So um, more important than uh, TCNA handbook or NTCA reference manual, please read those recommendations from the manufacturer. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I've got a few questions here, but I got a couple of my own again. Can you just go through again? What is the general rule on flashing height? Uh, usually it's about six to eight inches. They, they they vary. Sometimes it's four inches, sometimes it's six inches, sometimes it's eight inches. If you look at a lot of uh, the details and the designs, uh, you'll see that you want to do a shingle overlap with your exterior waterproofing coming over that flashing. So that if there's any water that gets behind there, it has a way of getting out. But if you terminate at the bottom, you've, you've negated and it, it's going to go into the structure. So you want to make sure that you go I, I would say a minimum, minimum. Six, four to six inches yeah. minimum. Yeah. Okay, that's really cool. The water, the water so, is never going to get that high. It's water, if it's pitched correctly, is going to flow off the. It's going to flow off the deck. You're more concerned about 
at that, tra you know, that transition, you know, wind driven rain. Yeah. And usually when you, somebody goes at eight inches is because they have two inches of, of floated mortar underneath that waterproofing is flashing up. So it still goes up like six inches after that point, but yeah, it's, it's used four to six okay. inches. Okay, cool. So when, when your system's used over a living space, do you have a warranty? Do you have a warranty with that, situ that, yeah, so that situation? Waterproofing, waterproofing companies, if their product is tested for over living space, because it's a different waterproofing test, um, and it's it, it almost falls underneath the, the envelope of a roofing material, uh, if you will, because the permeation rate is very low, our products do are low, you know, 0.15, uh, and Noble Deck is less than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, you're using a product that can be used over living space, but make sure that that company, whatever company you use, but hopefully you use us, uh, is rated for over living space. Our warranty is 10 years for, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, that's our warranty on Noble Deck. Uh, different manufacturers, I'm sure, have different warranty scenarios. So your point's well taken. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no superseding over overriding warranty per se industry wide. Depending on what the manufacturer has to offer, ours is 10 years for our system. Yeah. So again, I'm just stressing this: check with your manufacturer. Yeah. Always check with your manufacturer. It's really yeah. important. I agree. All right, here's one. Here's one I think is probably answers itself. But should you apply exterior deck membrane before or after door tracks, door slides, hardware has been installed? When when should you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it definitely before any of that uh, hardware gets put down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you we, we chuckle, but I was on a job in Phoenix where they somehow wanted to ha have it happen after the tracks and everything was screwed. It's like Alabama too. Yeah, you were on that yeah. project. No, I, that was my reason for bringing it up because it seems like it's a very logical question. But on the same token, in the field, things happen out there, and it's really important you do it the correct way and, and follow through all that. Yeah, one trade gets in front of another, and then there's no yeah. collaboration. Yeah. Communication. Yeah. Now, before I get to our attendees' questions, I have one more quick one. So, so Jim, should I let? <laughs> I, so should I let my tile contractor evaluate whether? My existing uh, deck joists, uh, uh, framing, and whatever can stand the the weight of it. How should I go about that? Should I have a structural engineer yeah, come yeah. in? When when it comes to that, you know, you th this is a very critical question when you talk about anything and and use the word structural stability, or you say, is there a deflection? Now, a deflection you can see, and you if if you can see the deflection within the deck, you know to change out those boards and change it out depending on that contractor he probably doesn't want to do it maybe so like hey don't get mad at me sometimes they, they just don't want to but if you have if your gut tells you i need to talk to a structural engineer or somebody who has uh is licensed and can tell me whether this structure is going to be able to take it by the size of the footings from the posts that are going up to the to the framing is my spacing in my framing uh, done properly is there sistering that needs to be between there do i have enough plywood on top should i put two layers those questions may not be done by the top guy. so don't put it on his back and just say oh well he says it's acceptable he's bought it now it's his responsibility that's not fair to the tile guy um i think that the, the onus should also fall onto the owner knowing that the structure that you're wanting to be done should have been looked at properly before to see even if it can accept tile. So yeah, the short answer would be just uh, if there's any kind of deflection, joist, framing issues, uh, consult a professional. I think is yeah. consult a that someone professional with that, yeah. though is important. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone who has a who's certified has the uh, has the uh, you know been trained to give you a, a professional answer because that's their area of 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 speciality. I mean, yeah. a top contractor might know instinctively or intuitively or just by experience, but um, if you want to know for sure, uh, you should probably consult with a structural engineer or someone mm -hmm. who can give you that information. Great. Excellent. Now, I don't really know that I know if this is a, a, a question or an answer to something that was asked, but it just says the type of adhesive should be a C2. The type of what adhesive that means? should be a C2. It sounds like it, it sounds like a, some sort of industry designation for a type of let's um, do it. Like a agent. Agent. Let's let's do it this way. I'm just going to ask Santiago, would you please put a little more information what you're asking there for us, and we'll answer it. We've got some more here. We'll go to. Yeah. 
All right. Does the warranty include the Midwest with freeze thaw? Again, you, you're going to want to check with your. Uh, there are some systems from some manufacturers uh, that they may exclude freeze thaw environments from their warranty. I know our warranty for our product is 10 years. And no matter where, no matter where you're at in the United yeah. States, yeah. All right, you guys. Uh, you've been fun. You've been very enlightening and very a uh, lot of information you gave there. I just want to make sure there there's still a hundred plus attendees on here. And if you're looking for information on the AIA, go to the handout section and just click on the very first item. Um, double click on it. We'll give you all the information how to go about getting any uh, courses available that uh, Noble has actually have in. Uh, uh, webinar you can watch at any time and get C, uh, CEUs for those and it will tell you how to go through and get that it'll give you uh, Dean and James's information on how to contact them which you have on the screen here but you don't have to don't have to copy this all down you can just print off that that uh, just go to that uh, document in the hands out section you can print it out and, and the new product announcement there too yeah, <laughs> yeah and the now. new product announcement is there yes definitely <laughs> yes. So, um, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank all of you that are still on here. Thanks for being here. And uh, gentlemen, fantastic job. And uh, I will talk to you soon, okay? Nice Everybody else have a great week. Have a great all right. summer, bye -bye. Have a great summer. Yep, see you soon. Bye-bye.